I am Elle Penelope, author of Epic Fantasy and Paranormal Romance, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello, friends. Today is Monday, December 27th, 2021, and this is episode 151 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. So if you have a question for me, please write me at podcast at lpenelope.com and I will answer it. This week's best thing is that 2021 is almost over. In my notes, I wrote that 2020 is almost over. And 2021 has felt like 2020 part two in large part. Uh, So one week left. I do believe in new beginnings. I really like the beginning of the year and the sort of the the new start. Um, this past week we had Christmas, so everyone who celebrates, I hope that you had a lovely one. I spent most of Christmas Day and much of Christmas Eve cleaning up my house because we were hosting um, family for Christmas dinner. And even though that process is always like agonizing, like I was sort of dreading cleaning my house, <laughs> like to the degree that you have to do when you have a company coming, It was actually really great because I'm starting the end of the year and the new year with clean, decluttered, you know, things that I'd been meaning to do for months, finally getting done. And, you know, it's a new start for the for the year, which I do appreciate. So I'm actually glad. It was also lovely seeing people. And we had two kids in the house for Christmas, so I am happily child-free, but uh, my niece and my cousin were over, and having kind of children energy on Christmas Day is nice, and then seeing them leave is also very nice at the end of the night. So yeah, uh, full of renewal and, um, you know, looking ahead to the future. So, writing update, I've been making good progress on the 1830s project. I've got prologue and two good clean chapters, working on the third chapter. It is going much slower than these things usually go for me, but I'm also having to do research as I'm writing. But I'm really happy that it's I'm making for forward progress. I don't have a, a hard schedule, which is kind of unusual for me, but I'm trying to reduce stress whenever possible. And also, this project doesn't have a hard deadline, so it's easier for me to uh, just allow it to take the time it takes when I'm not writing to deadline. And I think that's important for me to remember, too, that, um, you know, deadlines are great. I work really well with deadlines. I like to have that hard stop. But it's also nice to have the freedom to not have to have that hanging over my head all the time. So that's moving forward. I got the uh, the proofreader's version of Savage City back, and I have gone through that. So Savage City is ready to be formatted. It's ready to go to the audiobook people, um, ready to set the release date and start the pre-order and all of that stuff. Good to go there. I'm trying to remember the stages of the different projects. Um, oh, I, I've actually technically finished the copy edits for The Monsters We Defy, which is due in a week. I still have to write the acknowledgements and um, the author's note. The author's note is mostly written, but I I did want to add to it. So the copy edits only took me like two days. It's pretty light edits. I apparently have no idea what a commas place is, which is something that I knew, but um, it's always fun having the copy editor (laughs) highlight every every commas place. And it's like, I've tried to get better with commas. I've researched commas places multiple times. And I thought that I had gotten better. And I haven't, you know, so there's more work to do there. That's why we have copy editors, though. I'm very grateful to them for their eagle eyes and their great understanding of grammar and punctuation, which I still struggle with, obviously. I decided to put off for another week working on the revision of the fairy tale project, the short story, but I do think I need to tackle that this week. So I'm going to have to do sort of more of a detailed schedule. Fortunately, hopefully this week will be much lighter work-wise and uh, I'll just be able to extend my writing sessions to encompass all the various tasks. I wanted to send a newsletter out last week, which never happened, so... That's another goal for this week, to do an end-of-the-year newsletter, because I haven't sent one. I sent a brief one in November, but it wasn't like a real one. It's been a long time. I generally send one every month, 
And I've been thinking about trying to increase increase it to twice a month because I recently saw some um, like newsletter guru talking about, you know, more frequent more frequency is better. I don't know that I have anything to say twice a month. I'm considering taking a newsletter course. You know, I do like taking classes maybe once or twice a year to, you know, either on craft or on marketing or something to improve the business. And I saw this newsletter class and since I'm not, I don't, I don't love social media. The newsletter is something that I don't mind doing, that I wouldn't mind putting additional energy into and growing more as a, as a sales tool, instead of trying to focus so much on social media. So I'm not sure if I actually have the time right now to take a newsletter class, but I probably won't increase the frequency anytime soon, considering, you know, I've been trying to send this newsletter for like two weeks and it's on the list. I had it on a specific day. I just, it just fell off the list because if it didn't, it didn't seem as important. I, I didn't prioritize it, you know? So the question is, you can only prioritize, truly prioritize so many things, like a certain number, a very small number of things in a day or a week. And um, I continually fail to prioritize the newsletter. So maybe doing it every two weeks is is, is, a, is a goal that would help me prioritize it more. Um, but it also is something that might not be realistic. I have to weigh that. So anyway, I was working on my 2022 production schedule, planning the books I'm going to write in 2022, when I'm going to write them, sort of um, anticipating deadlines and things like that. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the process that I use in case it helps someone. So the first thing that I wanted to do was figure out exactly what I did in 2021. How long did it take me to write the books that I wrote? Um, You know, that gives me a good snapshot of what was possible this year and what should be possible next year. So this is something that I, I do have been doing for the past few years. I usually start out on paper. So I take a sheet of paper and I write the names of the months on each line. And then I do columns for each of the books that I worked on. And I thought that I had kept really good records because I do have a spreadsheet for different books and um, especially when I have a deadline, you know, I'll create a spreadsheet with the dates and, you know, what I did each day. But my notes were kind of incomplete. So one of my goals for 2022 is to create really uh, very detailed notes or a spreadsheet on exactly what I'm doing every day. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But going back to this current year and what I did. So what I worked on in 2021 was The Monsters We Defy and Savage City. And then this 1830s project, plotting it. So I sort of went back through my emails. I went back through the spreadsheets that I did have. I looked at the dates in Scrivener, the program Scrivener. Um, it, you can look at each scene and see the date that the scene was started. And all every time I go into a scene and revise it, I make a snapshot in case I need to go back. So I can see every day that I worked on each scene. And that lets me know, okay, I did the fast draft in this month. And then six months later, I came back and did the revision. And it took me, you know, over four days, I revised the scene. And so I really went back into all of this documentation and recreating what, when I did what. So I came up with this schedule on paper and I transferred it into a spreadsheet. So this is how it went. I started the fast draft for The Monsters We Defy in October of 2020. So October and November was the fast draft, aka the very first draft. From December to April was the revision. Now, all of that time wasn't completely in revision. I did take a month or two off here, a few weeks off here and there, but we're calling that revision. So December, May 1st, it was done. I didn't turn it in until June 1st. Um, it was with the editor for about two months. Then in August and September, I did the revision for the developmental edits for my editor. It was back with the editor in October. I got the line edits in November. I took a month to turn those around. And then I received the copy edits in December. And that actually is like the fastest book I've ever, I've ever written, I think. Um, although, you know, that timeline is fast because my editor uh, is pretty fast. Like she only had the book for two months, which is unprecedented for me. But if that's 
going forward, if that's, I can rely on her to be about eight weeks with a book, that will help me with my planning for next year. For Savage City, this is a book that has gone through a lot. I had many versions of it from years ago, but I did start from scratch. So in April of 2021, I started rewriting it from scratch. And so this is a little bit of a different process because I didn't do another fast draft because I had the story in my head for so long. But so we'll consider this like revision number one from April to July. I sent it to the editor and to beta readers in August. They had it for about a month. September and October, I did the revision. November was copy edits and December was the proofread. And then this 1830s project, I didn't record exactly all of the plotting. I spent a lot of 2021 researching and plotting and coming up with the synopsis because it's a collaborative project. I had to go back and forth with the collaborators on the synopsis to get the final version. And then in November, I was doing, trying to do a sort of NaNoWriMo. So I did the fast draft in November and then I'm starting the revision in December. So I have that all laid out on my spreadsheet my snapshot of this year. And that helps me go back and look at this and figure out, okay, next year. There's a specific template that I like to use when planning the year's production schedule. It's a calendar that has six months per page horizontally in columns. So um, I will link to it in the show notes if you are interested. And so yeah, what I did was mark on this piece of paper what I think the timing will be for the projects for 2022. So in 2022, I need to write the second Orbit book for my two book contract with them, the second Savage City book, and I have to complete this 1830s project, which is the real outlier because what I'm doing now for this project is the proposal. We'll have to sell the book and then I'll have to write the rest of it. And so those dates are completely up in the air. I don't know how long it will take to sell. I'm assuming it will sell. Like we're going with the optimism that the book will sell and that I will write the rest of it. So keeping in mind that a lot of things are up in the air in terms of exact dates, I just do my best to figure out, well, I know my orbit contract is in existence and I will have to meet that deadline. Savage City is the book that I self-publish, the series that I'm self-publishing, and uh, I know when I want to turn that in. So I have my own deadlines, and so this new thing is going to have to work around those deadlines. So whenever we do sell it, assuming that we do, I will have to be like, okay, this is when I can write it. This is the deadline that I can meet, and that will have to be taken into consideration. So yeah, I figured um, I'm going to use the rest of January to finish this proposal for the 1830s project while I can, you know, work on the plotting of Orbit Book 2, draft Orbit Book 2, January, February, draft Savage City, March, go back to Orbit Book 2 for the revisions, April, May, June, July, August. So I give, I've given myself five months for the revision of Orbit Book 2 because it took me five months to revise Orbit Book 1, which is the Monsters Read Defy. Then we're in July, going back to Savage City Book 2 for the revision from July th- through October, then basically using last year's Savage City um, schedule as a template for next year. So doing it around the same time uh, and then having it due and ready at around the same time next year. And then After that, I have time to work on this 1830s project. So assuming that it will have sold and that I will be able to begin finishing it in September and turning it in either November or December. And then if I finish Orbit Book 2 in August, it's with my editor for about two months. I am planning to revise in November and December. So this is just the sketch of it. It's something to help me organize my idea of how the year will go. The year will probably not go like this, but certain things kind of have to, you know, in order for me to get these three books accomplished. When I did two books, two full-length books this year, plus a couple of short stories, like there are other things that I did that aren't, you know, on this schedule, but that's why I leave myself big blocks of time, like five months for revision. I don't need five full months every day of those five months. 
in between those things, I know other things are going to happen. I might get edits back. I might get proofreads back, you know, so I give myself a big chunk of time. And in that time, I also need to probably take breaks to think about things. But, you know, I have I have the structure of the year and something to to work towards. Next, uh, the next step in my process is usually to put this on some kind of Gantt chart. I'm a big fan of Gantt charts. Uh, I like to see everything laid out and and in that you know that design just helps me. I use Team Gantt, which is a, a something that I found that has gives you some free Gantt charts. I've I've used Smartsheet in the past, but um, because I use it sometimes for work and for writing. But there's other free tools available that are good for Gantt charts. So if you like a good Gantt chart, I'll put the link in the show notes for what I'm currently using. Yeah, and that's that's my schedule. That's how I'm uh, approaching it. And I feel good about the schedule. It's a little bit aggressive. I also like to use this uh, horizontal month template because it allows me to see when I've got too many things going on the same month. Like I can, I can do two things in a month. Not, I mean, I have to do two things every month, essentially. Three things in a month is extremely difficult. So I was moving things around. I was using my um, erasable pens and like, oh, oh no, if I do that, uh, that's three things and that's three revisions in a month. Like I can probably, you know, do uh, review copy edits while I'm revising, while I'm drafting, kind of doing that now. Um, But if I have to revise three different books in the same month, that's just not going to happen. And I know it's not going to happen. So I would prefer not to schedule it to happen if possible. And looking at the schedule, um, much of the month, much of the year, like at least four months in the year, I'm only doing one thing at a time. And then the back half of the year gets a little busier. And, you know, if I, it's possible I could finish some of these things earlier and, um, you know, things are going to have to shuffle due to to deadlines. And, but this helps me say, okay, this is what I'm doing. Hopefully I won't get into a situation like I am now where I've agreed to a few too many other things and I've piled up on myself in a way that I didn't anticipate. Also due to to these floating projects that I don't know when they're going to come back, when I don't know when they'll get approved or sold. And, you know, I just need to be better about staking out the time. So everything usually works out. I'm able to finish everything some kind of way. I'm hoping to do it with a little less stress than I have in the past. And I'm still feeling pretty, pretty good now. Like I'm not super stressed about this work stuff, which I really appreciate. So hopefully that means that past experiences have allowed me to learn. I've learned from these past experiences and doing better. So for next year, I have downloaded a calendar template into uh, Google Sheets. And I'm just marking off every day what I do. So drafted chapter one, revised chapter two, did research for each project. And so hopefully that will just allow me to create this much more easily next year without having to sort of reconstitute my schedule through all the different means that I did this year. And I like that. I feel like I'm starting as I mean to go on, starting strong, starting organized. Things may fall apart as they tend to do and tend to shatter. (laughs) But um, I did the best that I could to, to, you know, get myself ready. In other news, we saw the new Spider-Man movie, which I adored. I really, really loved it. I thought it was great. We also saw the new Matrix movie, which I did not feel so good about. Um, I wanted to rewatch the trilogy. I decided not to rewatch the first one, the original Matrix, because I'm so familiar with it. Like, I've seen it countless times. For those who don't know, I do have a Matrix tattoo on my arm. I have the words, there is no spoon on my inner forearm. So the Matrix, the original Matrix was very important to me. And uh, I think it's like basically a perfect movie. Matrix 2 and 3, I saw like once each when they came out and I prefer to forget about them. But I was coming to the Matrix Resurrections, number four, with an open mind. So I rewatched the second one. I don't even know what it's called. It's Matrix 2. And then my husband and I decided not to rewatch the third one after we had sat through the second one. So I watched several recaps on YouTube of the third one, which I think was sufficient. 
And then we went to the theater to see the fourth one. Um, it's on HBO Max, but I wanted the theater experience. And then afterwards, I texted my brother, just watch it on HBO Max, because you'll probably need the captions and don't even bother venturing into the theater um, for that movie. I did not like it. I think that's pretty obvious. And I don't want to go into it too much. I will recommend um, Michael Hospital's podcast, uh, QFD, Quantum Froth Dispatches. His latest episode, as of the time I'm recording this, is on his thoughts about Matrix Resurrections, which I think he articulates it very well. Um, he has some really interesting theories about what Lana Wachowski was trying to do. I had commented on a Facebook post of his that, you know, I think it was an epic troll for the fans. I think it was a middle finger to Warner Brothers. It was very meta. It was very... I think I think some of his conclusions were that she tried to make a bad movie as a statement. Maybe that's... I, like, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I really... I do recommend his podcast in general. Um, and I, I think that he has some really interesting things to say about... Art, you know, like as a piece of art, apparently it is making people talk about it and think about it and have conversations and disagree. And and that is the point of art. So while it's a bad movie, is it bad art? That's, you know, something that I think is worth worth discussion. I think challenging people with your art is, is an important thing. But I also think challenging people with, you know, a hundred million dollar blockbuster movie is maybe not, like art films, I go to an art film, I go to Jim Jarmusch or Hal Hartley for challenge. Do I go to the Matrix for challenge? And yet, the first Matrix was in a way challenging. It was because, but not in that sort of way where it was not enjoyable. You can, you can create a cinematic experience, you can create a story that gives you lots of ideas to chew on. And I think that's the best use of the art and the blockbuster together. When it's not a satisfying story, and you're challenging, and you are you have a message, and you are saying things, that's when it starts to fall apart. And that's what I think this Matrix, the challenges with this particular movie were. And the other challenges was that it didn't need to exist. I think that she, the, as the director and co-writer, knew it didn't need to exist. I think her hand was forced, and I think she responded in in a way that, in, in some ways, I respect. You know, if they're going to put you in a corner and force you to make a movie, then you make a movie. And that is what it is. It's a movie. Anyway, didn't want to spend that much time on it. So uh, this week, my goals are to keep pushing forward on this 1830s project, to revise my short story for the fantasy romance fairy tale anthology. I've got to complete this author's note and acknowledgments for the monsters we defy, and that is enough goals. (laughs) Those things seem possible, provided that work, I take some, some days off work. I don't check my email until like 2 or 3 p.m. <laughs> Maybe do, you know, some late work time and, and spend big chunks of my day writing, which I think I should be able to do. Let us cross our fingers. Um, have got New Year's Eve coming up. I usually do quiet New Year's Eves, but, uh, and I don't think that's going to change this year. But I'm looking forward to 2022. I'm looking forward to these projects, these new books, these new ideas, and starting fresh, looking ahead, And um, I wish you the same. So I hope that you have a wonderful week and I will talk to you next week. For episode show notes and to sign up for the footnotes newsletter and get the show notes in your inbox, go to myimaginaryfriendsshow.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and watch the video episodes on YouTube. I would really appreciate a rating or review to help support the show. And My Imaginary Friends is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more fantastic podcasts, go to frolic.media slash podcasts.